Hello, and welcome to the Walrus Talks at Home Inequality, presented by Oxfam Canada. I'm Jennifer Hollett, and I am the Executive Director of the Walrus. I'm also your host and moderator tonight, and we are thrilled to be joining you online, bringing people together across the country and beyond live in conversation. I'd like to start by acknowledging the land that I'm on in downtown Toronto, Ontario, Toronto. A land acknowledgement helps us recognize history, thinking about how it informs where we are now and what changes can be made going forward in a commitment to reconciliation. At the Walrus, our offices are located within the bounds of Treaty 13, signed with Mississaugas of the Credit. This land is also the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, Toronto is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We are really honored to carry on a tradition of storytelling and welcome, we really welcome you at home to take a moment to reflect on the land that you're on wherever you're joining us from. As part of the ongoing work of Reconcilie Action, if you haven't already done so or done so recently, we encourage you to read the 94 calls to action recommended by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we'll put that in the chat. This year, the Walrus turns 20. And we are celebrating 20 years of Canada's conversation, taking a look at who we are now. Find our stories wherever you can, online, thewalrus.ca, but also in print. I have a copy here, available on newsstands or by subscribing to The Walrus. You can also listen to our podcasts or attend events just like this one. And this work is powered by our donors, our supporters, and our partners. So thank you for all being here and to Oxfam Canada for making this event possible. I now like to welcome, and if you could join me in a warm welcome to Lorraine Ravon, the Executive Director at Oxfam Canada. Good evening. Good evening, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, first off, I'd like to acknowledge that I am joining this event tonight from the unceded Indigenous lands of the Ganyangihaga Nation here in Montreal. I am really thrilled that Oxfam Canada is presenting our second Walrus Talks on Inequality. I know this, this topic is on everyone's mind these days as we see the cost of living rising everywhere and record levels of people around the world going hungry. At Oxfam Canada, our mission is to fight inequality and patriarchy to end poverty and injustice. We do this by working on three fronts, providing life-saving humanitarian aid when conflicts and natural disasters strike, supporting long-term development projects in partnership with communities around the world, and advocating and campaigning to change the laws and practices that keep people trapped in poverty and that perpetuate inequality. This week, Oxfam launched our annual report on inequality, which shines a light on how the super rich shamelessly profited from a global pandemic that has brought suffering and hardship to so many. The richest 1% bagged nearly two thirds of all new wealth created in the world since 2020. That is obscene wealth accumulation, never seen before in the past century. And if it hadn't been for this extreme greed, just imagine how many truly positive things we could have sparked into existence with these resources. Our world is in the midst of so many crises that some days it's hard to keep track. Whether it's climate disasters, a scary new COVID variant, looming economic recession, or ruthless attacks on women's rights, every single crisis we face is fueled by inequality and in turn is making the world more unequal. That's why at Oxfam we see fighting inequality as the solution. Inequality breeds crises. It makes them last longer and makes them cause more harm. If we can tackle inequality, we can start to reverse these damaging trends and build the healthy and resilient societies that most of us dream of. So tonight, I'm really looking forward to hearing from our fantastic lineup of speakers, including my Oxfam colleague, Alexandra Haas. The four of them will certainly shine a light on injustices, on obscene wealth and on structural violence, but at the heart of it, this is really a conversation about hope and about creating a more just and equal world. So thanks again, everyone, for tuning in, and thank you to the Walrus for this partnership. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Jennifer. Thank you. And yes, we are going to get into it because the conversation 
around inequality, specifically income and wealth inequality, is the conversation. It touches everything and really everyone. I think any conversation that I have been a part of listening, moderating over the last couple of years, ultimately someone raises this. So what exactly is income inequality? Well, it's how income is distributed throughout a population unevenly. Think of the frame, the 1% versus the 99%. Inflation has steadily increased over the last year, which we're all feeling in some way, whether it's mortgage payments or the cost of food on the shelves in our grocery stores. And the big question is, how do we close this growing and growing gap between the rich and the poor? And we're talking the really rich. Here's how the Walrus Talks at Home works. Each speaker has five minutes for their talk live, and this will be followed by a moderated Q&A session with the speakers and all of you at home. So feel free if you have an idea or a question to submit it at any point in the chat. We also encourage you to share this conversation on social media. If there's a quote, uh, we love seeing how you're watching us. So feel free to take a picture wherever you are. You can tag us at the walrus on any of the platforms and you can use our hashtag, hashtag walrus talks. Tonight, we will be hearing live from Soheb Shahid, Director of the Conference Board of Canada, Alexander Haas, Executive Director, Oxfam, Mexico, Joel Solomon, author and co-founding partner of Renewal Funds, and Lynn Grew, Chief Executive Officer, Native Women's Association of Canada. Thank you all for joining us. And we're gonna kick things off right now with Soheb Shahid, over to you. Well, uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, and hello, everyone. My, my name is Soheb Shahid, and I'm a director here at the Conference Board of Canada. Uh, you know, economists are concerned about inequality because several economic studies have shown us that more inequality leads to more instability, uh, less social cohesion, and lower economic growth. In other words, no good comes of it. But contrary to popular belief, income inequality has decreased in Canada in recent years. You know, access to education, health, our income tax system, and support by the government have all combined to reduce income inequality. In fact, soon after the pandemic hit, we saw a drop, a sharp drop in income inequality thanks to pandemic-related income support programs like the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, the CERB, which boosted after-tax incomes for low-income workers by more than their usual earnings. And up until last year, uh, wealth inequality had also been declining in Canada, thanks in part to low interest rates. You know, we do better than the United States when it comes to economic inequality, but we're really middle of the back uh, when compared to other developed countries, especially the Scandinavian countries. So there's quite a bit of room for improvement, especially when it comes to women, you know, racialized communities, indigenous and northern communities, and other groups. But the path forward uh, doesn't look too bright. You know, decades high inflation continues to hurt us. Uh, and, and this is because low income Canadians, they spend a larger proportion of their total annual expenditure on shelter compared to high income Canadians. They also spend a larger share of their spending on food when compared to high income Canadians. Uh, similarly, when energy prices go up, once again, it's the low income households that are hit the hardest because they often live in homes that are not as energy efficient as the homes of the high income. So whichever way you slice it, it's the low income Canadians that are bearing the brunt of higher prices. And yes, you know, overall inflation is coming down, uh, but food inflation is still going up. Uh, and remember that lower inflation doesn't mean lower prices. It simply means the speed with which prices are going up is decreasing. So inflation is a major channel uh, through which inequalities in our society are being exacerbated. But inflation is not the only problem here. Rising interest rates means lower house prices. And the reason this is a problem is because low-income Canadians' wealth is mostly concentrated in real estate, which means that they are hurting more than the wealthiest Canadians, who usually have a more diversified portfolio, for example, investments in the stock market, private equity, and not just real estate. In fact, according to latest Statistics Canada data, the least wealthy saw their wealth drop more than double the rate of the wealthy in the second quarter of last year. And do you remember what happened right before the second quarter of last year? Well, interest rates started to go up. 
and interest rates will continue to go up. But the higher and faster they go up, the more the likelihood that we see an increase in the wealth gap. And then you have some structural factors such as technological change and the green transition, which will bring a tremendous amount of economic and environmental benefits, but if not managed well, they can also disrupt the economy and we'll have winners and losers. So it is important that those affected the most by upcoming change are supported and retrained. So what can policymakers do? Well, taxing wealth is not easy. You know, I can see the rationale behind it, but it is not an easy thing to do. You know, wealth taxes are notoriously complex. They are hard to administer and can generate a lot of uncertainty. You know, many European countries such as France uh, have tried and then abandoned wealth taxes in recent years in part because they caused the ultra wealthy of the country to leave the country, uh, taking their investments and businesses with them and leaving the people behind with fewer jobs and a higher tax load. But if you think about it, it is the intergenerational transfer of wealth that causes persistence in wealth inequality. So taxing inheritance might be a better idea. Canada has no inheritance tax currently, but a wealth transfer tax could certainly help. And apart from that, you know, targeted policies, very well targeted policies that enhance the skills and education of our workforce can help reduce inequality and improve our near term and long term economic potential. And all of this should be done through the lens of inclusive growth so that economic prosperity can be shared with others and so that no one is left behind and so that the social fabric of our society stays strong. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alexandra Haas. I'm executive director of Oxfam Mexico. And thank you so much to the Walrus for organizing this and to my colleagues at Oxfam Quebec and Canada for, for organizing and inviting me. Um, I'm thrilled to, thrilled to be here talking to you about my majorities and minorities. Philosophers had thought about the nature of being human for many centuries, and they had accepted the idea that humans were unequal. For more than 100 years, it was acceptable to talk about equality and to question the status quo without thinking seriously about the idea of equality of certain groups, particularly indigenous people or people of color. But in the second half of the 20th century, in the aftermath of World War II, most countries had extended voting rights to women and were on their way to questioning whether the claims of equality stood the scrutiny of discrimination or what the Supreme Court in the United States called the strict scrutiny test. What it meant was that any difference in treatment of a group that was identified as a discriminated group should pass the strict analysis of a court to make sure that the measure, policy, or law wasn't contributing to more inequality. The strict scrutiny test has been copied and replicated in many other courts around the world, including the Mexican Supreme Court that has in recent years been at the forefront of important rights of marginalized communities, such as equal marriage or the right to work for people with HIV, to name but a few of the topics that have been addressed in landmark cases. So there is an important body of work that includes minorities that uses the concept to identify groups that are marginalized from access to rights. It is often used in scholarship and activism as a synonym for the agenda of equality and diversity beyond national and ethnic groups. Sexual diversity and migration are also called minority agendas in many places and treated as such. And this is the case of Latin America and particularly the case in Mexico. Now, Latin America is one of the most unequal regions in the world with many of the richest people on earth while violence and poverty continue to be pervasive. Oxfam's report published yesterday in Davos highlights that while the region has 30 new billionaires since the beginning of the pandemic, bringing the number up to 91 for the region in total. There are 12 million more people in extreme poverty. That is 400,000 new people in extreme poverty for each new billionaire. So what role does discrimination play in this reality and how does it relate to inequality? If you take a closer look at who is poor in Mexico, you will see that the darker skin toned people as well as indigenous people and communities and particularly women have less access to education, social protection and decent work. The data also shows that public services that are designed for the poorest are of lesser quality and not universally guaranteed. And this is mirrored by the tax structure that is deficient in tax collection in general, 
taxes only accounts for 13% of GDP in Mexico and has important exemptions for the richest, like the deductibility of education and private health services, while there is no inheritance or wealth tax. So inequality in Mexico is not only about the rich and the poor. It can also be read as a system that keeps certain people in poverty, and more importantly, it keeps certain people on top. Social mobility surveys have shown that it is hard for the poor to move up the social ladder, and particularly hard for those with a darker skin tone, but it is almost impossible for a people born rich to descend. This is because political, economic, and social power is in the hands of a few. A more precise way of describing it is that the influence of politicians is in the hands of the privileged, who don't necessarily get their hands dirty in the game of politics, but who hold the real power to influence the outcome of political processes. This is what Oxfam calls the capture of the state, and it has worked efficiently in favor of the richest. So the pyramid-shaped society we live in is not well explained by the framework of minorities, as is understood in high-income countries, because it fails to explain that the problem of discrimination is not a problem of having a majority that is well off with certain minorities that are marginalized. What we see is a minority of privileged people, families and businesses, and a majority that is marginalized. That is not to say that there aren't specificities within certain groups, but recognizing the differences and the specificities of each of those groups and their particular needs should not make us overlook that there is a shared problem among more than half of the Mexican population, that the state has never been organized to serve the majority of, as citizens with equal rights, and that the minority concept has been useful to make small, though meaningful changes, but it hasn't served to challenge the larger economic structure that benefits the oligarchy. We need a progressive tax reform and a more decisive labor reform to create an economic system that allows for the state to fulfill its central role, the guarantee of access to universal rights for everyone. Thank you. Hello, I'm Joel Solomon. I'm based in Vancouver, also known as the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Salish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I immigrated to Canada in the mid-1990s. I'm from Tennessee originally. I was brought to Canada by a phenomenal visionary, a woman named Carol Newell, to help deploy what she considered quite a bit of excess capital that she had inherited. And she wanted help to do that work. It was, of course, an extraordinary opportunity, which I'm very grateful for. We did a number of things together. We helped to launch what's now known as Makeway, formerly Tides Canada Foundation. We uh, helped invest in Hollyhock, uh, educational retreat center that hosts what we feel are important gatherings of social change players and operatives in numbers of different fields. We were initial investors in Renewal Funds Company, which I'm a co-founding partner of. We have several hundred investors from around the world who, want, who uh, appreciate our work in climate technologies, uh, household, uh, ha green households, and products that help reduce uh, waste and harm. We have funded broadly in social change activities of all kinds. Uh, I want to talk about my own situation. Uh, with a coming from a family of Eastern European uh, Jews who made their way into the US for better opportunities and found their way to Tennessee. Uh, my family has made it financially. They succeeded uh, on the classic uh, opportunity of immigration. We have enough, I have enough. I have done my best 
to not only see that uh, I use whatever wealth and influence and power that I have for my best effort at improving things for society in general. How much is enough for those with wealth? I have plenty of, I have enough. That's clear. I want to use what I have to help see a more fair and just society overall. I'm committed to be involved in pol politics wherever I am. I think that's crucial. I hope that everyone listening will not turn away from that responsibility, but be great citizens. Those of us that do have more than enough have a major obligation. We need to be lead voices in insisting on higher taxation on we, the wealthy. We need to be supporting social services and a better society. And I can tell you as an immigrant from the US, Canada is well ahead and that is precious and important and we need to protect it at all costs. What is my role in the horrific tragedies and unfairness throughout society and in our lives? It's, it's not a simple question. I think a lot of people on this call are, are those who are thoughtful, caring, and pay attention and each do our best to be good citizens. It's really important. Tax cuts for the wealthy? To, it, I, in order to uh, stimulate the economy? I don't buy it. We must ask ourselves how much is enough, what is my responsibility, and what is it that we are each going to do to be citizens who make a difference, who care, and insist that we have a more intelligent, caring, and supportive society for everyone. Thank you. Good evening, and uh, thank you for asking me to be part of the Walrus Talks at Home event this evening. My name is Lynn Grew, and I am the CEO of the Native Women's Association of Canada. And I'm always eager to discuss income inequality. I'm very passionate about it. It's important that we talk about the gaps that exist in our country. Uh, it's an issue of injustice. It's a human rights issue. And at the Native Women's Association of Canada, uh, much time is spent uh, talking and thinking about ways that we can contribute ourselves to ending these inequalities. And it's something that we are doing our best to tackle ourselves. But what does the gap look like? What do the inequalities look like? Uh, I would just like to quote the 2021 UN Human Development Index measures that have placed Canada in 15th place, 15th place in the world. But we know that Indigenous people are between 63 and 78 in the world for in terms of longevity of life, education, and standards of living. So that is a very uh, important and serious gap that exists between our uh, uh, in within Canada. Shrinking that expanding gap between the incomes of the very rich and very poor, or even just halting the spread of it, is critical to improving the rights of Indigenous women and girls and gender diverse people in Canada. There's a lot of talk today about reconciliation and even economic reconciliation and what is needed to restore or uh, end this inequality that has been for Indigenous people since time of colonization. And the issues are complicated. It's a, it's a long, it's going to be a very long process for Indigenous people. We have structural uh, laws in place, such as the Indian Act. We have uh, uh, still suffering from the effects of residential schools, missing and murdered women. Uh, and we know that in order to move forward, we still have to talk and deal with our past and our history. Uh, that has been noted in more than one report to be a genocide. And we know that to build uh, our economies, our Indigenous economies, and financial resilience, we do have to uh, talk about these issues and really understand what are these stru structural barriers that are in place to, uh, to really work at them and, and move forward to happy and productive lives for Indigenous uh, people and communities in Canada. 
uh, it's not just a matter of living standards for Indigenous people, in particular Indigenous women that I want to talk about a bit more. Uh, it's a life and death matter. In 2019, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women said that in order to end the violence against Indigenous women, uh, we need to end economic marginalization. The two things are linked together. Um, and so ending that uh, violence is something that, again, we are working on uh, every day at the Native Women's Association of Canada. We also believe that economic reconciliation and social innovation are counters to that violence and they're keys to ending what the National Inquiry did describe as a genocide. Our organization, uh, we take these issues seriously and we are not just waiting for the government of Canada or for other people to take matters in hand. We're working very hard on our own towards economic prosperity, economic equality for our communities. And I'd like to give you some examples of, of some of the things we're doing. So we do have a national apprenticeship program that is set to help 4,000 Indigenous women uh, and people learn skills for certification of Red Seal construction trades. So I think that's a very significant uh, program that we have. We're also working on another program to for employment uh, and for education. Uh, we have a mentorship program called Be the Drum for Indigenous women who are starting their own businesses. And we have our own uh, social and cultural innovation center where we are piloting a number of initiatives that will help Indigenous women uh, and Indigenous artists uh, start their own businesses and participate, be full and equal participants in the Canadian economy. So um, we're working hard on training our communities and working hard to get them into uh, good employment in areas of construction, in areas of uh, um, with computers and this, these kinds of skills. So again, if we're talking about reconciliation and we apply that concept to what we're talking about tonight, I would say that for reconciliation to take place, all of us have a responsibility, us, those who work in organizations, community, Canadians, non-Indigenous, we all have a role to play and ensuring that we don't have second class citizens in a country uh, like, like Canada with such an incredible uh, human rights record in the world. Our governments have uh, helped, they have uh, put in place some funding and programs to help end uh, Indigenous uh, poverty, I'm going to call it. And they know, they have a better understanding now with these reports that have come out, that it is important for Indigenous people to design some of these programs and uh, uh, deliver these programs as well. Um, it's important for self-determination. So if you if you are an exam an employer if you're out there and you're an employer um, you know we like uh, to have uh, the employers trying to hire uh, indigenous people it's very important and I have a little story to tell I'm coming to the end here of my presentation but I have a little story to tell and it's about a client that we have and her name is Marcy and she's part of our D be the drum program she lives in a remote reserve in Saskatchewan and she makes star blankets. They sell for about $450 a piece, but she can't afford to buy a long arm sewing machine. And that machine costs about $11,000. But if she could have that machine, then she would be able to double uh, her output. So these are the kinds of things sometimes that can help uh, Indigenous communities, just helping an Indigenous woman start her business that helps her family, helps her community and helps Canada overall. So we strongly believe at the Native Women's Association of Canada, we believe in social innovation, we believe in economic development, economic empowerment, economic reconciliation, and that we need to find new ways of doing things. Some of the old Band-Aid uh, solutions are not working anymore. Some of the approaches are too colonial, and we need to have that transformational change that the National Inquiry Report uh, talks about and other reports talk about as well. And I'd like to end with a little quote from Mary Simon, who said in her installation speech, and she's our governor general, for those of you who are in other countries, reconciliation is a way of life and requires work every day. Reconciliation is getting to know uh, one another. So today we're getting to know one another a little more, and I hope that we can move forward on uh, economic reconciliation in Canada. 
Thank you, Miigwech Marcy. Thank you so much. Thanks to Soheb Shahid, Alexander Haas, Joel Solomon, and just now Lynn Gru. All right, this is where we get to open up the conversation and dive deeper. To the audience, let us know where you're joining us from today. It's always nice to see as we get to know each other where people are coming from. We've just launched a poll. Where are you tuning in from? Hello to audience members. Gosh, we have people registered from all over. Calgary, Fredericton, Richmond and Vancouver in BC, Laval. We also have an international audience. This is an international issue. So outside of Canada, we have people joining us from LA, Los Angeles, over to Manchester, Cardiff, and more. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Now, a reminder, if you have a question, it's not too late, just submit it in the chat. Now I'm gonna welcome back all of our talkers. Just turn on your camera, cameras and we'll move into a question and answer discussion. I have a few questions to kick us off. I really appreciated hearing all of your perspectives. Uh, so, hey, you mentioned that income inequality has actually diminished in Canada and Louise in chat pointed out that that's surprising. I found it was surprising uh, too. Has it <clears throat> decreased for everyone? And when do people start feeling it? Because I think there are a lot of people who be like, really? It has with so much going on. Yeah, absolutely, Jennifer. And I think, you know, that's why I mentioned that, uh, you know, contrary to popular belief. So if you look at these things historically, we see that in the 1980s, we saw an increase, a rapid increase in income inequality. We saw a further increase in the early 90s. I remember that was a time when the government was tightening its belt. Some of the transfers were being reduced or taken away. Uh, but if you look at you know, the 90s all the way until the pandemic, you, you don't really see a clear evidence of income inequality going up. And once the pandemic hit, you know, we had CERB, we had other government transfers uh, and support that actually led to an increase in after-tax income for a lot of Canadians. Um, now, this is not to say that you know, things, are, things are great. You know, they are not, right? So yes, we're doing better than the States, but we're really middle of the pack when compared to a lot of European countries countries and a lot of developed countries out there. Now, as we move into, you know, into the months ahead, we're seeing rising interest rates, which will exacerbate wealth inequality. We're seeing high inflation. Yes, it's coming down, but still very high. That will also exacerbate the income inequalities we see around us. But the third thing that will hurt uh, inequalities around us are the fact that a lot of the government support that was provided early on in the pandemic is now being taken away. So those incomes that went up early on in the pandemic, they're coming down now. And someone in chat also pointed out it could play out differently for someone living with a disability, for example, in terms of what they might have access to. Absolutely. You know, marginalized segments of our population, you know, disabled Canadians, uh, immigrants, women, youth, Oftentimes, when it comes to public policy, these marginalized groups, these vulnerable segments of our population, they slip through the cracks. So what is really needed is targeted support, you know, very well targeted support that is temporary uh, so that, you know, the incentive to join the labor force doesn't go away, so that the incentive to innovate doesn't go away. And I think what you need is some kind of a guaranteed income program. Uh, and we've seen that in the past, some of these programs have helped uh, low-income Canadians, we have the Canada Child Benefit uh, that has helped to allow more women come into the labor force. That helps. Uh, that has helped Canada's long-term economic growth prospects. That is also that is also having a disinflationary impact, and that has also helped reduce child poverty. We also have had the old age security that has helped uh, some of the older segments of our population, and then we've also had the guaranteed income supplement. So we need other similar programs that are really targeted to certain segments of our vulnerable population. Well, Lynn, I'd like to invite you in because the focus of your work is Indigenous women. So these uh, are you know, two different identities, intersectionality in terms of uh, how these issues might play out. You mentioned the power of women having their own businesses. I'd also love to hear where else you see potential for Indigenous women to feel supported and to address some of those gaps where other programs might not serve them well. Oh, we'll get you unmute there. 
So unfortunately for Indigenous women and Indigenous communities, as you know, there's, we're still struggling with issues of water on reserve. We're still struggling with um, housing, with violence against women. So we, you know, we need to deal with some of those things in the forefront. But we strongly believe, and the National Inquiry report, which was over a thousand pages with 231 calls for, for justice in there, they said to end some of these structural inequalities, you have to end economic marginalization. That means jobs, concrete Concretely, it means jobs, it means education. So there's an investment to be made uh, in that continued investment for Indigenous women to have opportunities to, to get educated. And I see on a day to day, a lot of women, uh, middle age, you know, middle aged or even more going back, you know, going back to school, they never had that opportunity. So we're talking about education, we're talking about training and in, in um, non traditional trades sometimes so in construction and different areas, and supporting micro micro businesses because for indigenous women they're kitchen table businesses so we need to see some of that a little bit more investment that way in social innovation and seed funds and things like that so um that's what i think yeah, and i would also encourage anyone at home that we also all shop so there's opportunity <laughs> yeah, yes. in terms of you know when you're looking to buy something uh, to support a small business or a small business run by specifically an indigenous woman Joel, thanks for sharing your personal story. You used a term that jumped out to me, excess capital. Tell me more about that choice of, of phrase. What does that mean? Thank you. Because of the many inequalities that are built into society and our modern nations, um, many of us or, or those who are privileged enough and maybe have the right access and background in histories and uh, family connections, et cetera, are able to accumulate more, more easily, and in many more diverse ways than most people can. There should be higher taxation on we who have more and earn more. There should be ultimately a wealth tax of some kind or wealth taxes that that happen in different ways, but we need them to be stronger and more, more important to society and stop uh, the kind of false debate about uh, who, who, uh, who and why do people get more money. It is not just because we're smart and ingenious and uh, know how to make the right moves. That's a bit of a false equation. There are, of course, many very, very smart and capable people who do excel. We can't really count on us, those of us that have more of the privileges and benefits, to self-tax, which could somewhat take the, the, the uh, methodology of philanthropy and uh, maybe making investments in small businesses. And there are all kinds of ways that we can help, but we're not required to. And the lack of a government intervention to make sure that there's a more balanced distribution of wealth is a super important and crucial uh, circumstance that we need to reach. And is that why you brought up politics? Because ultimately it comes back to that? Well, I bring up politics because politics affects so much and we can too easily decide to be cynical about it and ignore it. And my own principle that I repeat to myself all the time is uh, ignore it at our own peril and at the peril of all that we care about. So we come up with all kinds of rationales and excuses and uh, ways to justify and rationalize why some of us can be more successful and uh, maybe pay even less taxes than people who, who earn lots less. So I think it's a really crucial topic. It's a very tough one. It's hard to get people to talk about it. It is an unpopular topic with those who have, and those who have also tend to influence policy a lot more than those who have less. Yeah, thank you for that. Alexandra, I really liked how you identified and flipped minorities and majorities. So are minorities with power aware that they are the minority? And are majorities who are marginalized aware of their power by numbers as a population. Because as you challenge us to, to flip it, it ultimately starts coming back to power and representation. Yeah, I think the reason why I chose to speak about this is because in my work for the last 10 years, 
what I saw is the way in which we wanted to change public policy. I work from, I come from a public policy background. And always when we ask the question in Mexico of, for example, how do you, um, let's say, design better education for programs for people with disabilities or for indigenous people and communities, uh, the question was always about residual um, budgeting and sort of, you know, putting on top of the normal program something to adapt for certain groups. And the feeling every single time was that this was never going to be enough, that they were always going to be treated as, you know, people on the margin that would get a certain small space in the budget and some attention, but never really treated as full on citizens with rights that should be at the center of policy making. And so that's why I started thinking about why the concept of minority in a society like Mexico doesn't really help because in a certain way, um, the construction of the, of the agendas of groups uh, has been good because we have advanced in some areas, but it has also divided those groups up into smaller sort of, you know, interest groups, instead of bringing them together to see what they share in common. Mm -hmm. And what they share in common is lack of access to rights. Again, a government that doesn't really think of creating services for all universal. And the, the simply, I think the data of the Oxfam report really points to that to the fact that the whole system works uh, in a certain sense to privilege a, an oligarchy, a small group uh, in, in detriment of the majority. And so I feel uh, that this sort of, it, it, it's more, more than questioning the, the minority concept really in depth. It, it's just a, a way of bringing it, uh, bringing it up to say, you know, we don't need to make small changes in budgeting or public policy. We need to rethink the economy. We, we need to rethink systems and structures. Otherwise, we're always, you know, putting certain people at the center and other people um, just, you know, try, trying to fix little parts of a big system instead of changing the system. We have a lot of great comments coming from, from chat. Uh, I'll go to Pat. Pat says, can there be a bit of discussion among the panelists about the pros and cons of a wealth tax? So who would like to take that one? And I'd love to hear from a few of you on, on that. Joel, do you want to start? And then perhaps Alexander, we can come back to you because it was mentioned in the Oxfam report. There are so many obvious reasons why we should have more taxation on wealth. There are ways that wealth is taxed, but it is still very privileged and not well taxed enough. Uh, it's easy to look at the facts. We, this, this whole claim that uh, uh, tax breaks for the wealthy will stimulate the economy and therefore create more jobs and more opportunities for others. I think those who uh, really put our attention onto the, that topic, uh, it's, it's an easy case to make if you are someone who can benefit and uh, know how to make money and have access to it and, and such like that. But if you look at the bigger picture and really think about fairness and how you make a better society, it's pretty obvious that we should have stronger versions of wealth taxation. Alexandra. Yeah, I think it also depends very much on where you sit. I mean, the, 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 the Oxfam report is global, but certainly for Mexico, it's a very, very important agenda. Mexico taxes really badly. Mexico only gets 13% of its GDP from taxation. It's really low even compared to Brazil or Argentina that are comp com uh, comparable to us. And the reason for this is basically the capture of the state, right? And so we had, an inc we had a, a, a wealth tax and we had a, an inheritance tax 40 years ago. And what elites have done, economic elites, is convince the governments, basically the, the, the cap through capture, that they should stop taxing them because they were going to invest all of their um, you know, all of their wealth reinvested into the, into the, in, into society. It really, I mean, it has happened to a certain sense. We can't say that we haven't grown or we haven't seen people 
people access um, jobs and all of that. But still, when you see that around 43% of people in Mexico live in poverty, you ask yourself whether it's really, really working out. Uh, but the other problem is that that has devoided the state of the resources it needs, not only for services to access social and economic rights, but even to have enough for infrastructure structure or security even. So when you have a state that has a really small fiscal space, if you take off, um, you know, service to debt um, and pensions, then the Mexican state has a really, really small space in, in fiscal policy to actually find and make priorities and to, you know, uh, invest some money into the education system, into health systems. And what you see right now is, for example, I was in a in an event recently where people were talking even about the coverage of, um, of vaccines for, for small children, which was a topic that we were over. We had universal vaccination, I think in the 1970s, we got that solved. And now we're going back to these problems because of the fiscal space. So I think there's no way of going around it. Some people say that Mexico could be seen as a, as a fiscal paradise even. So we need to look at who is paying taxes and who is able to avoid them. And then thinking about the whole structure, it's not only wealth and inheritance, but also taxes collected at a local level, like um, property tax, for example. I have more audience questions to get to. So the next one will be for Lynn and, and Sohabe. Victoria writes, inequality eats deep into society. It saddens me because capitalism thrives in inequality. It feels like equality and capitalism uh, are mutually exclusive phenomena. What do you think is needed to strike the balance? Uh, Lynn, would love to hear your thoughts in terms of back to the system of capitalism. Would you unmute there? <laughs> So certainly for, again, for Indigenous people, you know, we would like to be full participants in the economy. Um, but sometimes when you've had structural inequality, inequality for a very long time, uh, you need a bit of a boost, right? So we need, we still need some investment into our communities that would be uh, higher than, you know, other, other communities. Uh, but, you know, we want to develop our businesses. We want to share in the prosperity of Canada. We don't just want to share in the poverty. There's some great examples across the country of uh, communities that are doing very well. And we need to take those communities, elevate them, take examples. So you're, it's very difficult uh, to stimulate economies on a, on a reserve in isolated areas, uh, but we need to work on that. And we totally believe in capitalism and getting into getting into the economy. So, hey. Well, you know, speaking of capitalism, you know, how much uh, should a government intervene in the market? Uh, you know, uh, is, is a question that, you know, politicians on both sides of the aisle have been debating for a long time. So, so I'll leave that aspect uh, to, to the politicians. But from an economic perspective, you know, we know that, you know, without intervention by the government, we can expect the economy to deliver equitable outcomes. So, you know, we all have different skills and the market values our skills differently at different stages of our life. So what we need to do is we should encourage entrepreneurs and provide them with the best opportunity, opportunities to succeed. Mm -hmm. And yes, you know, that would create millionaires and billionaires. Um, so we need to strike a balance by allowing the free market to deliver incomes and then use public policies such as taxes and transfers to help redistribute income. And in formulating policy, the idea really is to limit the costs of these income transfer programs, which can come in the form of reduced work uh, and investment incentives. So striking a balance is what's needed indeed. But if the last few years of public policy, policy tells us anything, it is that striking a balance is not easy. Mm -hmm. We have an, another question here. This is from Rachel. It's for any panelists. Do you have any suggestions of policy solutions that do not rely on economic growth as an ultimate goal? Thinking about degrowth, circular economic, economic systems. Anything come to mind? Alexander, I'm gonna I'm gonna tag you in just because I, I see you reacting. I just, I just, I was thinking about um, the whole concept of social economy or inclusive economy, which is something that we work on in Mexico. And I know many other countries have policies around that. Mexico really doesn't have a policy uh, to promote um, 
you know, cooperatives or other that type of, of uh, business association. But I think it's it's a, a really good way forward. And if you see some countries like Germany, it can be a big piece of the economy, much bigger than, than it is in Mexico. Uh, but for a country like Mexico, where you have marginalized communities, a lot of them indigenous, a lot of them, um, you know, far out and, 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 and rural, it's really the way forward, uh, not, you know, the the regular sort of capitalist kind of company, but actually a cooperative that brings together the talent and the capabilities of a community uh, that puts some added value into products and that has a network of fair trade around it that really does bring back to the community uh, and gives it a fair a fair price but it's a whole economic system that you have to build and it does need the investment of the state through policies and taking off red tape because this these are specific barriers that women for example in in indigenous communities really face that when they want to launch companies i'm sure i'm sure lynn can speak to that much better than i do Yes, I, I, I would like to comment on that, Alexandra, because I am in total agreement with you. So social innovation is one of the ways that we are working on and we are seeing is working. So we have, for example, the Native Women's Association of Canada has a store. So it's a retail outlet and it's doing very well. And all of at the end of all of this, so we're buying from, I'm going to say it's now hundreds of very small uh, entrepreneurs from across Canada, and we're we're selling these goods. And at the end of all of that, the profit it goes back to community. So it is a way uh, we managed to do this uh, this innovation uh, with some of our own funds, and it's absolutely working. So there, I I strongly believe in it, um, and and it, we do need some support with it, but it's 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 perhaps a way to be looked at more carefully. Thank you so much. We want to get to a couple more uh, questions and uh, quite a few questions coming up in regards to politics and the voting public. David writes, why don't the vast majority of the voting public have or use enough power to cause just and equitable tax policies that result in equitable incomes and opportunities? What do you recommend to achieve this? Um, how, do you, how do you get more people to vote or, or to vote for these issues. I will say, I think it's um, fair to make the assumption a lot of politics avoid these topic, politicians avoid these topics uh, at election time because they're not always popular. So Joel, you brought it up, curious how you answer that question. Well, it's one of the opportunities that we do have to be organizers, to share what we care about and what we think we can run for office we can support people who choose to run for office. In fact, I think it's crucial. I believe that ignoring politics is one of the great sins. Uh, there are good arguments for why people want to do that, but it is neglecting our role as citizens and one of the most valuable possible activities we can do is to be organized around political parties or around uh, social issues and, and other issues. And if we exert our power, in those ways, we make a difference. Uh, yes, it's imperfect. We don't have a lot of other options that it seems that society is willing to, to act on, especially in uh, modern countries. Uh, but uh, if we look around the world, we see lots of social movements and times where people get together around egregious challenges that need to be dealt with. We can look around the world. We could spend a lot of time here on the end of this talk, just looking at examples around the world. So uh, I, I, I grew up in a family that uh, taught me that this was one of the most important responsibilities of citizenship, and I practice and preach it wherever I can. Well, we are just about at time, and I want to say thank you to all of our talkers for your talks, but also this lively discussion. Thank you so much. Soheb Shahid, Alexander Haas, Joel Solomon, and Lynn Gru. And a special shout out and thank you to this audience who have just been coming at us with these questions, but also policy discussions. So I think this is a, a good sign of engagement, but also a real mainstreaming of this issue. All right, I'm going to tell our audience a little bit more about what we have coming up. 
on Tuesday, March 7th, join the Walrus at noon Eastern time for the Walrus Leadership Forum, Trust in Democracy, presented by Proof Strategies. As we were just talking about politics and how to get involved or how to get more people involved, we're actually going to be looking at why this is such a big issue. Voter turnout has seen historic lows in recent elections, so experts will be sharing their findings and insight into how trust levels across Canada will impact our leaders and ultimately institutions now, but also into the future. We also encourage you to visit us at thewalrus.ca slash events. You can find our schedule, register for any upcoming events. We also post videos from all of our talks and we'll be posting this full event as well as the individual talks in the Walrus Talks video room on our website. Keep an eye on your inbox. We will stay in touch. We're going to send you an email. And if you don't want to miss any news from the Walrus, especially around events, I encourage you to opt into our newsletter. The Walrus is a registered charity that produces award-winning journalism, events, and podcasts, and we do this thanks to our community of support. So if you enjoyed this free event, consider making a donation at thewalrus.ca. Just click on donate. All gifts of $20 or more will receive a charitable tax receipt. Thanks again to our friends at Oxfam Canada for your great work and partnership. Uh, we will also include a link to the report that was mentioned so you can dive deeper. Thank you to our annual sponsors, Air Canada, Inspire, and Shaw. And thanks again for tuning in. Have a great evening in your head.